You know, it's been ages since I've played a DOS game, and what better place to go than Apogee, the height of gaming excitement. And unlike a certain pinnacle of entertainment software, Apogee could easily live up to that pedigree. Back in the early 90s, they developed and published the biggest PC games on the market, your Commander Keens, your Wolfenstein 3Ds, and yeah, your Duke Nukem's. The Duke himself started out as part of Apogee's lineup of platforming shoot-'em-ups before Apogee changed their name to 3D Realms and started making their own blockbuster FPS games. But back in the day, boy, after experimental artificial intelligence gone rogue John Carmack made it so you could actually do side-scrolling games on the PC like you could on your Nintendo, the hits kept coming. And one of those classics was Biomenace, a little less well-known than its cousin Duke Nukem, yeah, spelled with a U at the time, designed by Jim Norwood with music by Bobby Prince, and in 2005, as a Christmas present to Apogee fans, the whole game was released as freeware, so that anyone could pick it up, boot her up in DOSBox, and have a blast. You know, unless you're looking for a game that didn't make you tear your hair out in frustration. I've heard people say that consoles cornered the market on brutally unfair games, and while Biomenace isn't as hard as, say, Ninja Gaiden, it did make me almost rethink playing it around the time I got to the third episode. Play the game, Sid. Yeah, I know, shut up. There's like 20 other people on this floor, why don't you go bother them? You are scheduled for artificial supervision between the hours of 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. Fine, fine. Jim Norwood says Biomenace was the first game he ever designed. And you know what? Good job, Jim. It's really solid in terms of the mechanics, honestly. Jumping, shooting, the graphics aren't bad either. You don't have a ton of frames to work with, so the animation isn't too smooth, but this was the early days, kids. 1993. And while Doom would also come out towards the end of that year, there was still a market for this kind of stuff. But the absolutely unforgiving, unfair, and unreasonable difficulty of this game? Okay, let me just explain the basics to you. Some mad scientist named Dr. Mangle released a bunch of mutants into Metro City, and CIA agent Snake Logan, owner of this sweet porn stash, has to deal with it. Your ride gets shot down in the city, and from there you have to make your way to Dr. Mangle's lab to put an end to this shit. Here's a fun thing, you have easy, medium, and hard difficulty, and on easy you get eight whole health points. Take a good look, because this is the last time you're going to see him. Playing on normal difficulty, like old Civvy forces himself to do, gives you a whole four hit points. You also get four on hard. Luckily, hidden behind your plane, there's some grenades and weapons. You've got the automatic weapon here, 99 free full auto bullets, very nice. You've got a super gun, which has bullets that do five times the damage. And you've got plasma bolts, which do even more damage, but aren't auto fire. They're good, though. Grenades, which come in three flavors. The first is your standard explosion. The second is an incendiary grenade that can burn for a few seconds and clear out a small army of creatures all by itself. The third is a landmine. Your basic gameplay goes like this. You get crystal shards and key cards to turn off force fields. And usually inside one of the force fields is a hostage you have to rescue. It gives you another key card to disable the force field that blocks the exit. So what are all these other keys about? Well, there are doors everywhere that require keys. Not specific keys, just one of these keys, which means since any of these open these doors, one should open all of them, but you lose all of them when you lose... But you... But these doors have score items in them, and also crystal shards, and sometimes extra lives, which otherwise you can only get by collecting 50 of these gems, or by reaching a certain score. So if you follow me, check this shit out. Jibs! Holy crap, look at all these corpses! These mutants are killing everybody! Now, you might have seen gore before in a game like Wolfenstein and Doom, but in a little Apogee side-scroller where all the monsters explode into bloody pieces of meat and eyeballs and shit? So remember how I said you've got four hit points? Not five, you don't get that extra one at zero like in Duke Nukem. Oh no, and even if it were, it wouldn't matter very much. Once you die, if you have lives left, you return to a checkpoint or the start of the level. Once you're out of lives, it's back to the save. There's no restarting the level with three lives again, fuck you. This doesn't become a problem for a little while depending on your skill with the game, but I think most players will probably start noting the unbridled bastardry of this game around Episode 2. But the foundations of bastardry are set up from about the second level. This flaming devil mutant here, he's a fun one. Unless you have plasma bolts, you can only hit him when he's not on fire. And he likes to jump around and screw you over whenever possible. He's no fun at all. And you're introduced to the most frustrating enemy in the game pretty early too, the snake. The snake doesn't look too intimidating, he doesn't have a ton of health, but he does have the worst attack. He spits these little blue blobs out. 
And you might think, hey, that's normal, and it is. But watch, kids, because unlike your average projectile attack from a monster, this one is set up for the purpose of ruining your life. Normally, a projectile attack would stop here. But this one bounces and sticks around and travels about halfway across the screen as soon as the snake is in view. And sometimes you can hit them while they're off screen, if you know they're there. Sometimes. But as soon as you notice they're actually attacking you, you have less than a second to avoid it. And you better not be shooting them because this is one of those games where you can't walk and shoot at the same time. But monsters have a habit of turning to face you as soon as you hit their eye line. And these snakes are placed at the top of ladders, so if you're trying to climb it... You can only hit the snakes by crouching or tossing a grenade. They are the absolute worst monster to deal with, and we're on level 3. Just to be clear, the greatest threat to Snake Logan is snakes. There's these green things which are on the ceiling, and they're not too bad unless they're on a ceiling you can't see, and they drop down and kill you, and there's no way for you to know that they're there. Then there's the slimes. Slimes can only be killed with explosives or plasma bolts. They travel incredibly slowly and they block your normal bullets. So if you're trying to hit a monster behind them, you won't. You'll spend probably 15 minutes of your entire playtime of this game waiting for slimes to move. Yeah, also. And these things, these robots that travel around the level in a path and soak up way too much damage, but also instead of just taking one bit of health away, they're instant death. How about the bouncing robots? Or the weird dumpster robots that don't actually hurt you, they just push you into spikes. Spikes are a pretty common element of any platformer, but in Bio Menace, they come in three varieties. Instant death spikes, not instant death spikes, and spikes that come up out of the floor, and you can walk over them if they're not extended. The first two are sometimes completely indistinguishable from one another, so that's cool. In the easy skill, your basic attack is a burst of three rounds. On medium and hard, it's down to one. But it's okay, the automatic weapons are pretty common in early levels. It's important to mention that the hit detection is based on the size of the sprite, not the shape. So Snake's hitbox is like this, not like this. At the end of episode one, you face Dr. Mangle. He turns into a giant mutant... Frog? Yeah, we'll go with Frog. As it turns out, Dr. Mangle is just working for a more evil guy named Master Kane. He's got a robot face and Fabio hair. But then there's episode two. Starts off innocently enough, before you hit the ant caves. This is the level where I place that point of no return marker for the difficulty in this game. These giant mutant ants are bad enough, jumping around everywhere, spearing you, and you can only shoot in two directions, so have fun on any of those ramps. See, you have these color codes, right? A lot of the levels have these, and you have to input them in the correct order, usually to get a bonus, and if you fuck it up, you get punished. Well, one of those is required to exit this level, if you don't want to lose a life. And if you fuck it up and you're not pretty good at this game, you won't have a life to spare. And you're on a time limit. Oh, and to get this color code, you have to jump over disappearing Mega Man-style platforms over an instant death pit. Now that's cool, thanks. Oh, and instead of showing you the color code like every other color code in this game, you know, since you might accidentally pass over it and see it without having to do all the platforming shit, it gives it to you through text. This is the only time this happens in this game. Good job, Jib Norwood, for thinking of that. You son of a bitch! But wait, because the next level, Ant Town, is much worse. From the very start of the level, as soon as you're off the elevator, get ready for some fun, because you have to jump on these two falling blocks. Now, you jump on the first one, right? And you notice before plummeting to your death that there's something shiny over there. That's the secret level warp gem. You want that. Then there's a cave that takes you above where you started, and there's plasma bolts. That's awesome. Now you need the warp gem, because it's gonna get you extra lives, and you're gonna need them after this level. This isn't the hardest level in the game, but it's probably the hardest one before episode 3. So you have to jump and hit the second block if you want it, because fuck you. You won't be able to land on the second block on the way back down. You need to take the second block down, then jump onto this tiny platform, then go through the cave, then back onto the falling platform, and these platforms disappear forever when you lose a life and go back to the start. So then you're really fucked. And there's an ant on the platform you need to jump on, and he lunges at you to his own death. What does he care? He's part of a colony, you know, fuck it. Theoretically, you can drop down on this little platform between the blocks, but 
You're not gonna know it's there at first, you're gonna lose a life anyway. Unless you can get on that ladder while you're on that falling block, which I couldn't, you're gonna have to take a hit from this ant here. Don't forget though, you have a leap of faith onto this elevator platform here, because you can't clear the jump onto the falling blocks for the next section, and you have to know to drop onto the elevator, which you would know if you used the ladders, but those are a pain in the ass, so... Oh, and by the way, if you die at any time before hitting a checkpoint in this level, it's back to the beginning, where you can't fucking jump anywhere because the falling blocks leading to the rest of the stage are gone forever. And about a quarter of the jumps you have to make, there are spikes everywhere. It's fucked up. This is where I think any normal person would put the game down. Anyway, let's check out that secret level. So I lose a life in the secret level I went to so I could get some goddamn lives. That's before we face the queen ant, who can go fuck herself. Because she shoots bees at you. Okay, flying ants, whatever. They're mutants, it doesn't matter. This whole level is a pain in the ass, but since this is a game where you get two or three bosses per episode, it's... Ugh. After the queen, you get to the trash dump level, where I have zero lives and there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> I make it through the trash dump with zero lives and get to the trash boss. I mean, it's only been one level since we had a boss. And Biomenace does this thing a couple of times that's just a dick move. It starts you off right in the boss's line of fire. And sometimes they can just shoot you from the start, taking that precious, precious health away before you can get off a shot at them since they're off screen. Oh, and you have to hit a switch to lower an elevator so that you can get out of his path and get some decent weapons since your guns and grenades don't carry over to the next level. But thankfully, your health does. There's one section of this game that has a ton of health pickups, where you get to turn into a mutant yourself and then turn back, so my question is, if it's so easy to go from mutant to non-mutant, why is this whole thing such an issue? The next level is a little deceptive, you see, could be a straight shot through with no resistance, but you need to dig a little deeper because I can't even imagine surviving the episode without it. You need to go through a couple of doors to find a strange key that opens a door marked Secret Door, which you first saw when you were killing Dr. Mangle. Inside that door is an easter egg room full of Apogee stuff. It's Jim, Norwood, designer, and George, Broussard, architect of Duke Nukem Forever's downfall, and Scott Miller of Scott's mystical head fame. There's a poster of OG Duke Nukem, pre-sunglasses, a bunch of sprites from Duke's original outing, some Commander Keen references, and two signs, Apogee and id Software. Upstairs you'll find three lives, full health, and a secret warp gem. And the secret level is- oh fuck, no, no, fuck! <laughs> So I'm forced to lose a life, but I get four of them in this level, and if I'm willing to sacrifice a hit point on this spike here, I can get full health. The lives max out at nine, I think, but this is the first time I've ever seen the lives that high in this game. You're gonna need all those lives for the boss level. The boss of the second episode might be the hardest boss in the game. He's surrounded by mutants and robots until you wake him up and then he shoots lasers at you forever. And you're gonna be down to your piss ant one-shot rifle pretty quickly because hitting the bastard is hard enough. He can travel through floors and walls and such, and some stuff provides cover, but whatever provides cover for you also provides cover for him. And good luck hitting him with grenades. I end this episode with two lives and one bar of health. Or if I hadn't found that easter egg, fuck all. Then we start episode 3, and episode 3 is the kind of video game cruelty usually reserved for arcade machines, so you keep putting quarters in. And I want to mention something here that y'all will have no idea about, because I didn't. I found this out after the fact. There are special moves you can do, a super plasma shot that will take away one health bar, fuck that, and temporary invincibility. You'd think that would be really helpful, right? Look up for two seconds and then look down. This might confuse you because the character doesn't look up or down. You need to hold the up and the down key. You need to release the up key before the down key, and then you're invincible for like three seconds. It takes about as long to perform this move as the move itself lasts, and the only decent use for it I can think of is running through one of these force fields to get to the exit and... Yeah, that's what I thought. So anyone in the comments talking about how I didn't use the super secret moves that I wouldn't know about unless I looked them up because I was researching for a video, 
You're gonna leave that comment anyway because I waited until now to mention it. But Sivy, there's a secret invincibility move. But Sivy, Mila Kunis is actually Russian. But Sivy, you didn't hear them say in Doom Eternal that you could turn but that Sivvy, off. But Sivy, Sonic the Hedgehog is a canonically sexual character. But Sivy, how can the robots operate with a quarter of your brain? That's not how biology but works. CV11, where's Frank? Where are the viruses? Tell us, or it's back to the cold room. CV11, target is. Frank Donald has gone off the grid. Off Sivvy. the grid. The CIA is concerned. I don't the CIA know. Gets concerned. Bad things happen. So episode 3 is just the worst. This is the point where most sane people would stop playing the game. Look at this screenshot. There's horrible things happening where you can't see them. Like there's one of those snakes just up ahead. But also there's hidden landmines that you're only going to avoid if you memorize where they are. I mean, you can randomly toss grenades to see if they hit anything. Fun, right? It gets better. Once you get inside the building, we get even more new unfair enemies, mutant suicide bombers. They run up to you, are faster than any other monster, are faster than you, and they explode. And you got a ton of snakes above those ladders, so expect to leave this level with no health or lives. Oh, that's not even where the bullshit starts. You can get two crystal shards in this level, a blue one and a light blue one. And one opens this beam to the exit, but you can't use it because the glowing green tiles are radiation and they instantly kill you. But the other way you can go is through this long tunnel full of mutants and laser turrets, and the laser turrets technically aren't an enemy, but if they were, they would be the worst. See if you can discern a firing pattern from these. Yeah, there's no fucking pattern. You'll try over and over and over again to find a way past these things, and you've got these four health bars that'll never, ever last. Maybe if you were on easy and had eight, but that's still nearly impossible. I tried over and over and thought maybe you're not even supposed to go that way because there's a secret where you can jump between ladders over an instant death laser, and I can't do that either. But no, there's a secret right above the entrance with an invincibility potion in it, and you won't see it, you won't know it's there, and you absolutely needed to get through this level. From here on out, we're dealing with uncut sadism. More problems than you could possibly deal with at once. Mines here, grenade shooting robots here, turrets here. These robots who soak up damage and also insta-kill you if you're anywhere near them. Because there's a level later that's called Circle of Death, where you have to climb and platform around them, and it's a fucking misnomer, Circle of Death, because there's three sections where you have to do this, and one of them is a leap of faith into them, so have fun. That's three Circles of Death. Here's Mutant's Attack, and I don't know if the designer knew what he was setting up here when he made this, but I'm gonna tell you. See, there's a funny little way that explosives work in Bio Menace when you collect them. The regular grenades are low tier, so when you get the incendiary grenades, they replace them. Like, you don't lose the regular grenades, you just have to use up the incendiary grenades first. That's weird, right? You can't switch between them. But here's where the dicking comes in. If you pick up landmines, which are nowhere near as useful as grenades because you can't toss them, they take priority and you have to use those up before you can get back to your regular grenades. So take a look at this area. You have a choice here. You can pick up two grenades and use them, but you can't go over and pick up that automatic weapon over there, because the way collision works in this game, you'll have to pick up the landmines too. And if you pick up the landmines, those aren't any good for dealing with the monsters up here. Because as soon as you hit the floor, that snake is gonna wreck your shit. More so since you have to place the mine, so maybe it'll hit you twice. It looks like the game is giving you resources, but it's really a jigsaw-like trap that forces you to take a handicap if you want an advantage. Oh yeah, and also the spikes. Fuck the spikes. This level took me hours. You wouldn't think it would be any harder than the instant death bots, but it's about the enemy placement, kids, and in a game that gives you not enough health and forces you to take damage, finally, finally, after the circle of death, after robots attack, after mutants attack, we face Master Kane. And thank fuck I accidentally found the secret warp gem that gave me some extra lives, because if I wasn't able to die like five times, I wouldn't have beaten this game. Ah, Snake Logan. You have proved most troublesome to me. And for that, I shall make sure that you die a most painful death. I don't know how you survived all of the traps I've laid out for you, but you'll not be escaping from me. I have been waiting a long time. For this moment, and I am going to enjoy very much getting rid of you once and for all. Then there will be nothing left to stand in my way. Now we shall see just how good your fighting skills really are. Ah! Ha 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 So Master Kane shoves a broom handle up your ass, 
And you're lucky to get those text boxes the first time you play because when you respawn or load a game, the motherfucker just starts shooting at you as soon as the level starts. But you can't hit him from there, and since you have absolutely nothing to fight him with, you have to get across the level, past mutants and landmines, and so then he turns into a ghost that insta-kills you? I'm telling you, Jim Norwood knew it was up. He wanted to make a ball-bustingly hard game, and he did. He succeeded. For all the dickishness in this game, it's totally intentional. It's well-crafted dickishness. He knew. Look at this. There's a checkpoint at the other end of the boss level. A checkpoint in the level where it's you and the boss in one big room because all the supplies you need are all the way across the goddamn level. And the boss is designed so that you can't cheap him out. If you're up there trying to hit him, he'll revert to his normal form. Notice that you're up there, and then immediately turn into an invincible one-hit kill flying ghost monster. It's not too hard to avoid, but it will catch you if you haven't dealt with all the other monsters and the landmines. So I killed him, but then I died, and the blue shard he drops, well, it dropped, but he wasn't dead yet. He went into ghost mode, and as soon as he was out of it, one hit killed him. It only took about 10 lives and two reloads to beat him. But it turns out, Master Kane is actually... Agent Carmichael! Carmichael? Yes. Remember me? From Operation Swamp Dog? You and the agency deserted me. I swore I would get revenge if it was the last thing I did. So I somehow found the resources to mount a catastrophic attack on major cities and learned to turn into an invincible one-hit kill ghost. No, we thought you had surely been killed by the KGB. You're insane, Carmichael. And you're coming back with me. But instead he pulls a predator and self-destructs. No, you are going with me, Snake Logan. Straight to hell. Finally, it's over, and Agent Carbicle will not be a threat to this Earth ever again. Snake has succeeded, and we are all safe again. For now. You might think I hate this game, kids, but I don't. It can be fun and challenging when it's not being terribly dickish. And the design itself is competent, especially for the first game this guy ever made himself. Snake Logan is pretty badass, and maybe he deserves another outing. More than someone I can think of who hogged all the glory with his 3D game and then self-destructed way harder than Master Kane did. But this isn't the last we'll hear of Jim Norwood. He worked on Shadow Warrior and currently works as a senior software engineer for Sony Computer Entertainment America. Good for him. Here's to you, Mr. Norwood. Your game from 1993 boned me pretty hard, but it's like getting a terrible hangover from a fine bottle of scotch.